Noel Harding for helping make the 2020 Research Forum happen. Uh, as I'm sure that uh, a lot of you are very conscious of, the, these are ve um, very unusual times. And this is the very first AASB Research Forum that's been held virtually, uh, which has been the direct consequence of COVID-19. Nevertheless, with the help of the virtual format, this, this year's forum is our biggest yet with participants in and outside Australia joining us today. The research forum is a great way to unite academia, practice and standard setting in accounting and have a real impact on the future of accounting and financial reporting. Today, I'm excited you are joining me with me to learn more about three very interesting research topics presented by their respective expert research teams. Session one, which starts at 10 o'clock, is the use and usefulness of equity accounting. Session two, which starts at quarter to 12, implementing AASB 16 leases, the investor and preparer perspective. And finally, session three, starting at quarter past two, are accounting standards understandable? Each session will run for one and a half hours and is conducted in 30 minute segments. The structure of each session is the same. The first 30 minute segment sees the research team speaking to their research and findings. A discussion between the research team and our industry experts that make up our diverse panel follows. The third and final 30 minute segment is a Q&A session. If you have a question or an opinion to put to the researchers and all the panelists, this is your chance. Any time throughout the session, please use the Q&A Zoom function on your screen and AASB staff will attend to it during the Q&A of the session. If your question or opinion is directed to a specific researcher or panelist, please indicate this at the beginning of the question or the opinion. In addition to the three research sessions, we also have two special guest speakers, Martin Lawrence, a director at Ownership Matters, who will share with us his views on how financial statements are used by professional investors, and Anne Tarker, a board member at the International Accounting Standards Board, who will give us an update of the IASB's work program and research opportunities. To start the day off, I'll pass in a moment over to Martin to give us his presentation on how financial statements get used by professional investors. Martin is the research director at Ownership Matters, which he co-founded in 2011. Prior to Ownership Matters, Martin was head of research for Australia and New Zealand at ISS Risk Metrics where he joined in 2006 from BT Financial Group's Governor Advisory Service, where he was Manager of Corporate Governance. I'll hand over now to Martin Lawrence. Thank you very much, Keith. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, uh, brief background, I myself am not actually a, uh, a professional investor, but we work for people who are. And one of the things we do for them is we trawl through financial statements to find interesting and weird things that may be material to the end investor. Um, if, Kathleen, could you bring up my slides, please? Thank you. Uh, and on to slide one, if we could, please. Thank you. So, I suppose the first thing to say is how do financial statements get used by professional investors? And I think one of the things that is often misunderstood, it's certainly something that I didn't understand before I started working for and with funds managers and other professional investors, is that the actual financial statements are not used that heavily by professional investors, which seems counterintuitive. There are some professional investors who use them very, very deeply and constantly. But one of the things that's important to understand is that for most professional investors, the primary source they will get financial data from is actually in presentations from management or through feeds from services such as Bloomberg or from broker feeds. Um, so this information comes in pre-canned for them to populate models, valuation models that they will run internally. They will have proprietary pieces to them, but they're for ease, these systems port the numbers into them. Now, this is partly because one of the things to understand about professional investors is when they get financial information. They get it in these huge dumps of data in Australia every six months. Uh, 
for example, and the two key periods are February and August, the two six month reporting periods. In the US and other markets, obviously this will be quarterly. And the condensed nature of this reporting season makes it very, very challenging for a professional investor to actually in depth go through financial statements. As an example, uh, I think the reporting season seems to be getting more condensed every reporting season. This year in the August reporting season, for example, of the top 300 companies, uh, of which 280 or 290 would be August, August and February reporters, of those, I would estimate 260 reported in three and a half weeks. Uh, and on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, you get a gigantic volume. People, for some reason, don't like reporting on a Monday or a Friday. And so you could have 50 or 60 large companies reporting their results on a single day. That obviously makes it very, very difficult for professional investors to delve into the financial statements, because these are also the days where you will talk to management. Uh, you have the earnings call. If you are on five or six earnings calls in a day, each of which lasts about an hour, your time to do anything other than just digest the information that has been shown to you is very limited. Now, a lot of investors will try and come back to the primary financial statements after uh, the reporting season dust has settled and start digging through them. But their ability and their time to actually come to grips with them in detail during reporting season is very limited. And because of that, you get this focus on the core financial statements. So the profit and loss and the balance sheet. And you see a reliance on proxies for things like uh, for cash flows using EBITDA. If you look at a lot of management presentations, when they talk about cash flow, they'll actually talk about EBITDA rather than the actual cash flow. And one of the things that tends to happen because of the reliance on presentations from management, because that's where you get the information about what's going to happen over the next six months, uh, or management's best guess on what is going to happen over the next six months, there's a very high reliance placed on street earnings, uh, the various terms people have for them, pro forma earnings, underlying earnings, adjusted earnings, operating earnings, but these are management adjusted earnings. Now, in some companies, these adjustments are very small and routine. In other companies, there are frequently very large adjustments, the nature of which change from period to period. And there's a lot of data coming out of the US that while a lot of investors will say, well, we don't focus on street earnings, street earnings do seem to explain a lot of movements. Um, and so because you are, you are using data from management presentations primarily or from broker feeds, these street earnings come in. If you have a look at the detailed financial summary information that will be at the back of a broker's report on a particular stock, you tend to find that it is a straight input of management's underlying earnings, management's preferred earnings number. And so again, this means that the primary financial statements, they tend not to feature as heavily as I suspect the preparers of them. And a lot of people who are looking at how professional investors use financial information think that they might. We move on to the second slide, please, Kathleen. So key aspects of financial statements. So as I said before, the analysts will tend to focus on those three core financial statements, the profit and loss, the balance sheet, and particularly in times of stress, cash flow. The times that analysts have the time or the inclination to dig into the notes is, it depends on the particular analyst, but often you will find that there is that reliance on those three big ones. And so you, the notes themselves, where a lot of the really interesting information lives, don't get the detailed attention, again, simply as a matter of time. Uh, there's just insufficient time for professional investors to go into them. The areas that I always find very useful and that our clients also find useful when we talk to them about it, the working capital notes. So trade receivables, inventory, trade payables. These are particularly useful when investors are trying to work out why cash flow doesn't look the way that they expected it would. And so, you know, the old metrics of days sales outstanding, days sales in inventory, levels of receivables, uh, have payables blown out. That is a, a core note that analysts will look at if they are going to look at the notes of the financial statements. But again, 
because you are dealing with a point in time piece of information, very, very often a, um, an analyst looking at these will tend to rely very heavily on management explanations. So to give you an example, Treasury Wine Estates, which is a company that as a wine manufacturer, their accounts are inherently highly judgmental because of the carrying value of wine inventory and because they are selling to wholesale distributors. Um, particularly under former management, there was always this kind of, well, you, I know the cash flow doesn't look fantastic for these six month period, but just trust us, we got all those receivables in the door in January and February. So actually the cash right now looks fantastic. Uh, Slater and Gordon, which is not to compare Treasury Wine Estates and Slater and Gordon, uh, Slater and Gordon was always a company that was able to talk to its investors and say, yes, I know that our cash flow doesn't look very good and the receivables and our working capital notes tend to suggest it's blowing out, but trust us, the next six month period is going to be a, uh, is going to be very strong for cash flow. Two areas that we think are incredibly useful uh, for users when it comes to working out what's happened are business combinations and discontinued operations. So the business combinations notes are incredibly useful because of acquisition accounting. And so, for example, there's a company that recently reported that I'm trying to get to the bottom of, it looks like that they had a benefit from inventory provision reversals in their accounts, which benefited their earnings. But there's no substantial inventory provision reversal disclosed in the financial statements. They did, however, do an acquisition. And so this is the old trick of you provide things on acquisition, which don't go through the P&L, and then you rely on those acquired uh, provisions to take expenses in the future, which means they don't flow through the P&L. Business combinations notes are also a really useful way to reality check management discussions about growth. Uh, there's a number of companies over the years uh, that have done the old roll up strategy of buying multiple businesses, giving the appearance of high revenue and high EPS growth. But then when you start to unpack the notes and look at the acquired revenue, those rosy growth uh, discussions fall away. Discontinued operations are also particularly useful. I mean, if you look at the major banks at the moment, all of them have very large and expensive ongoing discontinued operations. Uh, and so that's a way of just working out real costs that management may not be upfront about because they're in that single line item down the bottom of the P&L of discontinued operations. Um, a uh, perennial one that is also very useful is the plant and equipment and the intangible notes, particularly software. Uh, this is just a way, I guess, to reality check earnings assumptions, uh, to reality check the quality of earnings. So if management are talking about uh, EBITDA and EBIT and how strong their earnings growth is, but the capitalized balances are growing very rapidly, that's a way that professional investors will use to reality check, well, hang on, what's going on? Are these uh, earnings as good as they look, or is it the oldest trick in the world that they are capitalizing expenses? And this goes on in a wide variety of places. So an example of professional investors who are very sophisticated users of financial statements and are very well aware of this, if you have a look at the major banks and their very substantial software balances, most professional investors who are specialists in covering the major banks uh, basically ignore the management uh, amortization numbers and back in their own amortization numbers because from bitter experience, their observation is that management tends to capitalize too much software and not expense it quickly enough and so will tend to impair it. And so a lot of professional investors will use the financial statements to work out how much was capitalized and what the balance is and then back work from that, their view of what the appropriate software expense should be. And in an interesting interaction between uh, fund managers and preparers of financial statements. If you look over time, those bank software balances have been reducing and the proportion of software that is expensed rather than capitalized each year has been rising. Uh, and that has come from in investor pressure and management teams going, well, we're not getting any benefit from the market for capitalizing software, so we may as well expense it. Uh, recent examples of this, you have seen uh, NAB, which previously had a policy of capitalizing all development software expenditure above half a million dollars, 
uh, increasing that threshold to $5 million, largely because investors were just looking at its capitalized software balance and saying that's insanely high. Or you have seen a company like ANZ, which seems to be the most aggressive in expensing its software now, substantially reducing useful life assumptions. After 10 years ago, the major banks were kicking out useful life assumptions. The last thing, which is something that has come into the financial statements in the last few years is around key audit matters. And these are incredibly useful to professional investors. And I'm frankly surprised how many fund managers actually refer to them and find them very useful. And these are because they're a useful guide to what the auditor thinks is important. The absence of information that you get from an auditor's report, particularly in a market like Australia, is one of the, I guess, great frustrations for investors. There are very good reasons why the auditor is not going to go through in detail the things it is worried about, uh, the things that it argues with management about in its audit report. But until the introduction of key audit matters, basically what you got in the audit report was the accounts are but true and fair signature, the directors are responsible for most of the stuff in here. Um, you've got nothing as interesting as some of the stuff you still get out of Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, the Shanghai Exchange. My favourite was a colleague once sent me uh, a colleague once sent me a, it wasn't just a qualified audit opinion, it was a refusal to give an audit opinion because the auditor had been unable to locate uh, the core place of business, the core place of uh, the factories that the company had, the bank accounts it said it had, and they just signed off by saying, and we resign. Now, the key audit matters are not that dramatic, but they do at least tell you what the auditor thinks is important and also how the auditor got comfortable with it. And as you, these have evolved, changes to those key audit matters are also particularly interesting. Uh, occasionally, the key audit matters will tell you information that is not in the financial statements. So, for example, uh, I can recall one company which it was the key audit matter that disclosed that they, the company was in dispute with the tax office and that's why its tax expense had jumped hugely. This was not explained anywhere else in the financial statements, but it was explained in the key audit matters. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So, the bad and the ugly. What's not great about financial statements as they presently are? This is not, the first point is not really a problem with financial statements as they are, just with the way that they are actually prepared and disclosed and audited. One of the big frustrations is critical information that the accounting standards say should be in there is often absent. So for example, uh, Orica, which reports on 30 September, has a capitalized software balance of 350 million. It has spent more than $100 million on software for the last two years. It does not disclose the useful life of software in its accounts. I've looked for it, you can't find it. If you ask them, they'll tell you, but that is just a, a major omission. Again, on software, Investors have discovered over the last couple of years that there are companies that have very, very large software balances, but have not previously separately disclosed them. So for example, AGL, the uh, energy uh, generator and retailer, it disclosed in its 2019 accounts that it had a $450 million software balance that had previously just been grouped within plant and equipment. Woolworths uh, in its 2020 accounts disclosed that it had a more than a billion dollar software balance that had previously been living inside plant and equipment. And so those combining of very large but quite different asset balances is something that it may be innocent, it may be just something that has arisen over time and has only been lately corrected, but that's a major frustration for investors. Uh, then you see other things that are harder to explain as just being a legacy issue. Uh, what you see companies that, for example, will combine acquired intangibles with an indefinite useful life and the software balance and made that affirmative decision to do that two years ago at a time when their software capitalization had just jumped. Those two things are nothing like each other. They have completely different expensing profiles and completely different capitalization profiles. But by combining them, you can, if you want to be very cynical, disguise how much software you're capitalizing. You also see decisions to combine provision balances, uh, to combine provision reversals and provision utilization, which again are two very different items, which a cynic would suggest is attempting to disguise the benefit of one particular type to the PL. Uh, 
And then you get other sort of recurring frustrations, other income in the tens, twenties, thirties of millions of dollars without any explanation of what that other income is or other expenses in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's just the absence of information. Some of the other frustrations that investors have is cash flow manipulation tools such as factoring and supply chain financing are often not disclosed. Now it's a really good discussion as to whether this is a problem with the financial statements or a problem with auditing. I think you can make a good case for either. What you are noticing is that over time as investors have become more focused on this, a number of companies have substantially increased their disclosure of it within the framework of financial statements. If you want a recent example of a company that's really improved this disclosure, Intertech Pivot, which has very, very substantial uh, supply chain financing balances. So this is reverse factoring, uh, factoring of payables. Um, and they've really upped their disclosure. The poster child for this has been Simic, which is a construction contractor. And so one of its great sells to investors was its very smooth and consistent cash flow, which a number of investors who were professionals in this space were kind of looking at and going, well, your cash flow should be volatile by the nature of what you're doing. So you just must have, you must have built a better mousetrap. Uh, and that was, you were able to work out their factoring, which was extreme by the absence of information and a couple of cryptic notes. They actually disclosed the fact that they factored extensively and were kicking out the terms of their suppliers in their sustainability report, not in the financial statements. So if you asked a professional investor their number one frustration of financial statements in the last year, they would almost certainly tell you it is the new lease accounting standard, AASB 16. This has been enormously disruptive for investors and I guess it's bad luck that it was also unveiled in a year of kind of unique impacts on earnings from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so the major problem that investors have with AASB 16 is that it has destroyed a number of the kind of rules of thumb and models that were used both in valuation and also just in the feeds coming from brokers. EBITDA is now a number that does not include most rental expense. Uh, cash flow. Uh, a very substantial proportion of lease expense has gone down into financing cash flow. Again, I think most of the investors' reaction to this has been frustration at how disruptive it has been to the financial statements, the creation of whole new asset and liabilities balances, restatement of earnings. Uh, I had one fund manager say to me, why is it that every single company that has adopted AASB 16 seemingly has a negative impact on earnings? They can't all be in that part of the lease cycle. I think over time, you will find investors, as they become used to AASB 16, they will start to appreciate some of the things it tells you. But to date, they would just say, this has been really disruptive, has helped some management teams obscure earnings, uh, and has just created a lot of headaches and disrupted how we normally used to do things. Uh, not all changes are bad though. AASB 15, the new revenue accounting standard, I think investors uh, welcome that because it did reveal a number of companies whose revenue assumptions were perhaps a little rosy. Uh, if you have a look at Technology One, which is an IT and software business, it lost from memory 75% of its retained earnings balances from the adoption of AASB 15. Uh, another CIMIC who I've already mentioned had a very substantial negative impact from being required to be more conservative in adoption of AASB 15. Another favorite investor hobby horse about financial statements, indirect cash flow. Uh, it is not a fan of investors. Having both direct cash flow and also the reconciliation of profit to cash flow is a, you know, investors find those very useful. But the indirect cash flow statement, I'm yet to find a professional investor who likes indirect cash flow. Uh, when we've talked to people who prepare financial statements, I guess one of the startling things you discover is that indirect cash flow, they will often say is how the cash flow statement is prepared, even uh, if you are reporting direct cash flow that you use the indirect method. A colleague of mine uh, discovered an error in a company's cash flow statement because the expenses line is a plug. Uh, and a couple of people have told us that, that the cash outflows for expenses are simply a plug. Um, that it's the number you add, the number that goes in there is the number that gets you to the cash flow number that you have. Uh, as one investor said to me, with what with 
this uncertainty about cash flow and the ability to manipulate your cash flow from period to period using trade financing tools. Cash flow is no longer king, it's prints, and the only numbers you can really trust are cash at the start and cash at the end. And the last point I'd say, which is, I guess, a financial statement issue, uh, it's a curiously um, orphaned uh, piece of disclosure in Australia, which is the related party disclosure rules, which kind of live in the Corps Act and kind of live in the financial statements and don't really live anywhere. And the disclosure rules in Australia around this are shockingly lax. The US, for example, simply doesn't allow you any kind of um, judgment call as to whether something should be disclosed. It's just, if it is a transaction with this type of person, above $100,000, I think the threshold is, it must be disclosed. In Australia, my favorite uh, two examples are, there's a listed company, ALS, uh, listed out of Queensland, very large global assaying company. We discovered the investor community that the CEO's son was a senior executive of ALS who had worked there pretty much their entire professional life only when that CEO left and his son was promoted into the disclosed executive group. Uh, now, the fact that that happened suggests that he you know, owed his place to merit. But again, it's something that you would expect to find out before that point. And the other one is there was a particular company that had had disclosed for years and years that a relative of a member of key management personnel held worked for the company. And we just noted this every year when we talked to people. And one year we were talking to them ahead of the AGM and they said, oh, thank you very much for pointing out uh, that uh, related party transaction, we fixed it. And we said, oh, well, you mean they're no longer employed? And they said, no, 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 we've just stopped disclosing it. You can move on to the next slide, please. What I wanna close with is the thorny issue of materiality. So the accounting standards have a very precise definition of materiality. So above 5% might be material, above 10% definitely material. But I guess what investors and management teams consider material can be very different. And this issue, I guess I first realized this distinction in notions of materiality when I, when I was talking to a group of audit committee chairs at a lunch that one of the big professional services firms had held. And one of them said, well, it's, as we were talking about a particular issue, they said, well, it seems like your definition of materiality is different to that of the accounting standards. And I guess our sort of assumption was that, uh, that you know, material is what the standards and our, our auditors tell us is material. And the issue is, is both for management teams and investors, materiality is very contingent. So for example, if you are a company that has guided that it is grow, going to grow its earnings five to 8% in the year to come, and you deliver 3%, investors are very, very likely to consider this material. If you're a REIT, for example, a real estate investment trust, and you have guided for distribution growth of 3% and your distribution falls by 1%, investors are likely to think that is extraordinarily material simply because of the earnings profile and the distribution profile of the stock what they are buying the company for. The other place where this is really material is when it comes to management incentives. And so a very cynical person would suggest that this means that you are like, that it's likely to have a disproportionately large impact on financial statements and in discussions to the market. So as an example, if the threshold for management bonuses is you have to achieve 95% of your earnings budget for the year, then the difference between doing 94 and 96 is absolutely material to management, even though it is not material in the accounting standard definition. So when we talk to boards and management teams and also to investors, we are often looking for things around the margins, the things that are the difference between making the middle point of your earnings guidance and coming in just below. As an example, there was a REIT four or five years ago that changed its definition of underlying earnings. The REIT community in Australia has adopted uh, a loose definition of underlying earnings called funds from operations. It's subtly different from REIT to REIT, but all of them report FFO and it's viewed as earnings by most investors in REITs. And this particular REIT had 
between the half year and the full year decided that software amortization would no longer be part of FFO. You really had to dig to find this. It was hard to find it. And if they had not made that decision, instead of coming in at the top end of their earnings guidance and their distribution guidance, they would have actually come in just below the bottom end. Now that would have absolutely been material from an investor perspective and also for management incentives. So again, this thorny question of what is material is something that I think financial statements with a very clear definition of its materiality and then the more contingent definitions used by investors and management teams is an area where I think there's a lot of scope for um, ambiguity. Uh, because something may not be looked at because it's not material from a strict financial statement perspective, but is absolutely material from a market participant perspective. And so with that, I'm not quite sure how we're going to take questions here, but I'm very happy uh, to take uh, any questions in the time we have remaining. Uh, I've got a question here of what do I think the appropriate software life should be that an, and that an investor should look for? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, if it, it, to a certain extent, it depends on the type of software. My personal view is that a software life of more than five years is incredibly hard to justify. Um, now I know that, for example, core banking software systems, uh, you know, banks do not change those in a major way repeatedly. I remember reading a story, I think it was Delta's booking system, uh, which had been built in the early to late seventies and was still in use. Uh, they discovered how old it was because they had to turn it off at one point and they couldn't get it to turn back on. Um, but I think five years or less is a, just a good working definition of how long software should be uh, expense for. Um, Yeah, I've got a question about the deficiencies we're claiming existing in financial statements. Are you reporting such issues to ASIC? Yes, we are. Um, and we also participate in other forums, uh, parliamentary inquiries, just pointing out things that are not as they should be. Um, I'll give you an example around business combinations notes. So the accounting standards say that you should include the revenue and profit contribution of an acquired business. Now, there are a number of companies listed on ASX who do multiple acquisitions every year. Uh, and they will say in their audited financial statements, well, we can't uh, quantify the revenue contribution because these businesses have been so well integrated. The thing that always drives me nuts is that those companies are usually in their presentations to investors able to quote an organic growth figure for revenue, which tends to suggest they know exactly how much revenue was acquired. They just, want to, they just don't want to make it easy by putting it in the financial statements for people to unpack it. Um, I've got a question here about the quality of executive remuneration disclosures in Australia. Look, generally they are pretty good. Um, there's always a couple of things that frustrate me. Um, I guess the area that receives the most attention is how Australian companies account for share-based payments expenses. Uh, so the actual executive remuneration tables use the accounting definition of expenses, which bears limited resemblance to the actual amount realised. Curiously, if you look across the entire market, the accounting expense across the market of uh, executive incentive expense is actually pretty close to the realised amount. It's just that for any individual company, it's usually completely wrong. Um, with that limitation, I actually think the disclosure is pretty good. It's an area though that I would say is under audited because the number of mistakes you find in the REM tables, just by going, well, hang on, what about that payment that you told us about last year? Where is it? Uh, is, is not uh, that you discover. Um, there's a question about highlighted that accounting standards allow for ambiguity. Do I think that should be allowed to continue? Look, ambiguity is in and of itself, not a bad thing. And I'd probably prefer the allowance for some ambiguity than attempting to come up with a set of rules that remove ambiguity entirely, because I don't think you'll ever be able to do it. I think that will lead to expenses and complications that I think will be counterproductive. I mean, part of this is that 
if it looks like a company and its management team are leaning very heavily on ambiguity in order to uh, present the best possible face, eventually the markets and reality will catch that up. And it's very, very seldom that you run into a company where you cannot deduce what is going on um, by its financial statements. As an example of a company that I used earlier, Slater and Gordon, its financial statements gave you a pretty good idea of what was going on, even if uh, you know, I think the earnings numbers were presenting a very optimistic picture. It was there for those who chose to look, um, is how I'd put it. I suppose what I'd come back to is that couple, the ambiguity in financial statements coupled with the peculiar nature of the environment in which professional investors consume financial information from companies can mean that the things in the financial statements that allow you to, dump, to reality check areas of ambiguity um, often don't get given the attention just through time pressures that they perhaps should. Um, sorry, I've got a number of questions here. Um, EBITDA, there's a discussion, um, how do analysts consider the broad understanding of EBITDA? Um, it's a good question. Uh, they, it's a non-GAAP measure, as someone has pointed out. Um, the, um, and the adoption of AASB 16 has actually, I think, forced investors to come to grips with EBITDA. EBITDA, I think, gets used a lot, one, as a proxy for cash flow, uh, as a kind of working capital adjusted cash flow number, which obviously has pretty severe limitations. Good investors, I think, just use it as a rule of thumb for debt service and other things, and indeed some banks use it that way. Um, but it is a, the best investors are aware of its limitations. And, you know, the, there's you know, markets are, contain a spectrum of, bo of both companies and investors. Um, got a, a question that directors should establish their own level of materiality, which should have no regard uh, for how um, the, the sort of formal financial statement and auditor definition of materiality. Uh, I actually would be positive. I think that's not a bad idea, so long as it's very firmly disclosed what the definition of materiality is uh, that the board has used. Um, I mean, I, in some of my darker moments, suggest that maybe we should do away with the formal requirement to have your accounts audited and make being audited a choice um, and see what happens. Uh, I suspect that would probably end up being a disaster, but as a number of Smart, far smarter people than me have pointed out, uh, every successful fraud has had its accounts audited and signed off. Um, I, I guess what we don't know is the but full question, how many others there were caught before that point. Um, there's a question around Australian markets as being inefficient um, with a good deal of private information existing. Uh, and then this, I suppose this is the efficient markets hypothesis and the inability of people to outperform the market. In large cap, and I'd say what you see in the Australian market is a bifurcation. In large caps, the market is very efficient. It's very hard to outperform in large cap space. Once you get beyond the large cap uh, area, so the top, I mean, depending how you cut it, the top 50, uh, the top 100, some would say the top 20, but once you get below that in the small cap space, it's very inefficient. Uh, so for example, part of our business advises institutional investors how to vote at company meetings. And there are a number of small cap managers who, who invest in smaller companies listed on ASX, who generally speaking will not vote against company management because they are fearful of being locked out of information. And so to me, that's a pretty good indication that you know, there is some inefficiency going on in the smaller part of the market, not the large cap space. If you look at the numbers, it's very hard if you're investing solely in large caps to outperform the market over time. Small cap managers though tend to have a very good record of outperformance. Um, around AASB 16, uh, I guess my point is professional investors uh, found AASB 16 immensely irritating because it disrupted their 
rules of thumb and their models and the way things that they had been, the way they had been looking at things for a long time. I think over time, you will see companies, you'll see investors realise the additional information that they have been given. I've certainly noticed it being useful already for particular companies, but it's just, it greatly complicated their lives for a year. And it was, I guess, exacerbated, which is always going to happen with any change of accounting standard, by some management teams talking about how well their EBITDA had done and not making it clear that they were talking about a non aasb 16 EBITDA number uh, compared to a number with all rent expense out. And there was a lot of that going on, whether by accident or design uh, amongst management teams. Um, and then you just had, if you took a company like a Ramsey Healthcare, Ramsey Healthcare was reporting earnings inclusive of AASB 16, earnings on a pre aasb 16 basis, underlying earnings uh, on a aasb 16 basis, and underlying earnings excluding AASB 16. And so just that multitude of data points just is confusing. So I, I think long-term AASB 16 is going to be a very useful change. I mean, for starters, it has made the um, cynical explanations for sale and leaseback transactions uh, a lot um, less appealing for management teams. Um, but I think in the short term, there's just a lot of friction and a lot of people just upset at having to get their minds around a new standard. Um, uh, someone's asked me what I recommend a publicly listed company which has practiced the best financial reporting. Um, this is always dangerous because when you talk about a company, almost certainly they're then going to do something to make you look like an idiot. Um, in my long and bitter experience. Um, look, I would say that the set of accounts that contains most of the information you would expect to find and you doesn't make you look for it, I actually think, um, but, and now that they've corrected their software disclosure, the Woolworths accounts have a very high standard of disclosure. Um, and they, you generally find out most of the information you want you find out, for example, the uh, in supermarkets, one of the few areas of earning of revenue ambiguity, because you know all of us who've been to a supermarket know that revenue recognition is pretty easy, because if you leave the store without paying, you tend to get arrested. Um, but is the area of rebate income or commercial income, which is what the supermarkets call it. So this is the rebates from suppliers based on volume. And so Woolworths started in Australia disclosing uh, the proportion of receivables at year end that comprised rebates that had yet to be received because that's the rebates that you don't know, you can't be 100% certain they're going to get. And so that disclosure was very useful. Um, they're the only company I've seen that's disclosed in advance what it's, um, that it's going to start doing supply chain financing. Um, I've never seen another company disclose in advance that they're going to start doing it or in the area of their business are going to start doing it. Telstra is another company that has pretty good and clear accounting disclosure. It's AASB 15 and now AASB 16 has made it hard to swim through just because of the nature of those changes, but it's accounts give you a lot of information and quite clearly. Uh, Martin, uh, yeah. it's Mark, Mark Shine here. So if we could just put one final question that I see there is uh, your thoughts on, um, Machine language uh, financial reports, XBRL, IXBRL. Yeah. Would you see those as an enhancement? Well, I think that would be good because anything that makes it easier for investors to suck the actual financial information straight into their models, I think would be great. Um, so we used to, I used to work um, for a large North American company, and one of the things, and we'd do exchanges uh, of analysts across teams. And this is kind of one of the reasons I think why the US has been able to do the machine learning, the XBRL stuff faster than us, is the standardization of disclosure in the US is remarkable. Uh, it, everything is almost always in the same place from company to company. Whereas in Australia, if you are aware of the different conventions that different audit firms use about how the accounts are laid out, you can usually get there quite quickly, but no company is quite the same. And so we'd have people coming over from the US to kind of uh, do short stints with us 
And that just struggled to find information because it wasn't standardized. Um, so I think those kind of XBRL machine learning stuff, I think that would be a very useful addition. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, your presentation has been very well received, as we can see from um, the questions and answers coming through, or questions coming through and the answers that you've given. Um, and also, I'd particularly uh, also like the way that you've managed those, <laughs> managed those questions. So well done on that. But uh, my apologies if I didn't get to your question, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's been an excellent presentation. And uh, again, thank you. And we will be now um, going to a break and uh, look forward to uh, everybody rejoining us after the break in about 30 minutes time. Thank you, Martin. Thank, thank you, you very much for having me. Okay. So just to add on that, so we'll be returning back at 10 a.m. Oh, my name's Doug Miller.
Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Sorry for the waiting. Uh, what's coming up next is the first research session of the day, which looks at the use and usefulness of equity accounting. This research has been conducted by Professor Michael Bradbury from Massey University and Associate Professor Tom Scott and Laura Maness from the Auckland University of Technology. I will now hand over the mic to Tom. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, uh, Al. Could you please allow my video to start? Thanks. Okay, thanks, Al. Can everyone uh, hear and see me now? Awesome. Uh, so, uh, could I get the first slide up, please? Thanks. So, before I started, I just wanted to say to all the uh, academic people listening that uh, I, I really enjoy doing the ASB Research Forum. I encourage those of you who haven't done it before to put in an application. Uh, next year, it's so much fun. It's the second time we've done it as a team. Uh, me and Mike, uh, it is really a lot of fun, and um, and everyone's always so friendly to us, even though we're the uh, New Zealanders, so to speak, in the um, presentation. Um, and before I continue, I would also be amiss if I didn't uh, mention uh, Laura Menes has been so helpful to us with this project, and uh, she is wrapping up her PhD and on the job market soon. So, so for those of you who uh, do you need uh, someone to join your team? Think of Laura. Uh, but meanwhile, on to the uh, presentation. Can I have the next slide, please? So just as some background information for those of you who may not be aware, what is this equity method of accounting we're talking about today? So essentially what happens is that if a company buys shares in another company, uh, which is what we're focusing on today, is that you recognize the investment at cost and then you adjust for post-acquisition changes in the assets. You then recognize a share of that investment, uh, whatever that investment, uh, the profit made by that investee, the profit made by that company is recognized in the investor's profit and whatever they make as other comprehensive income is recognized in your other comprehensive income. Dividends decrease the investment and these intercompany transactions are eliminated as well. This is required under IS28 or, uh, or uh, and, and that's the standard in effect in New Zealand or Australia. Uh, and it requires it for associates and joint ventures. We're st focusing just on associates today. That's what it's currently required for, but it has a pretty long and varied history. At different points, it's been used as a consolidation method. Uh, it's been required for subsidiaries excluded for consolidations, just for associates, for joint ventures as well now. And at different times, it's been voluntary as well. So it has a, a really strong history about how we're um, using it. So next slide, please. Sorry, next slide, yeah. So when do we use equity accounting? So for associates, which remember is when you're a company and you've bought and shares in another company, how you account for that investment depends on how much uh, shares or what influence you have in that other company. So we know that if you control the other company, you do consolidation, you completely combine the financial statements and remove intergroup transactions. Now, there's a, an official definition of control, but the rule of thumb we quite often talk about is you clearly have control if you have 50%. You have to use equity accounting if you have significant influence on the other, uh, the other company and it becomes your associate. Again, the rule of thumb here, there's a, a list of uh, guidance in the standard, but the rule of thumb sometimes people talk about is more than a 20% investment would be considered a uh, significant influence. If you don't have control or significant influence on the other company, then you drop down and use financial instrument accounting, which would typically say use fair value uh, for that investment, with that fair value uh, going through profit and loss or uh, OCI in some cases. Now, once we frame it up like this, equity accounting becomes really interesting because we can see what, in some ways, accounting views as the alternatives to it. That one alternative would be consolidation or proportionate consolidation, and the other alternative at the other end of the spectrum is fair value accounting. Now, this is sort of one of the things that actually got me interested in equity accounting as a research project to begin with, because when I teach accounting standards, I always get really confused whether to teach equity accounting before consolidation or after consolidation or before fair value uh, financial after fair value financial instruments. And I think that really reflects that it's not clear when you look at the standards whether account, uh, equity accounting is supposed to be 
uh, a mini consolidation where you just have a one line account that you increase with the profit or decrease with the profit, or it's supposed to be sort of a mimic of fair value accounting, where instead of fair valuing based on market conditions, you fair value based on changes, uh, you mimic the fair value by adjusting it for changes in the accounting number of it following the financial statements of the other company. And so this really leads to a really inherent question in equity method of accounting that we're going to come back to uh, several times is that is equity accounting uh, a mini consolidation method or is it supposed to be a measurement basis like cost or fair value in some way? And answering this question is really important because it gets to the heart of the issues about whether who we want to do it by, whether we should be doing it, and where should the gains be going to. Uh, so next slide. So here in an academic paper is usually where we would have your conceptual diagram or your model. Uh, and maybe it's just because we're the New Zealand team, as I said, but I've really been thinking about equity accounting in terms of uh, a platypus. And what I mean by that is a platypus is it, when you look at it from one way, it looks like one type of animal. If you look at it from another way, it looks like another type of animal, but probably it's its own unique animal suited to its own situation circumstances. So here we have one angle, maybe it looks like a one line consolidation method. One line looks like a measurement basis. I also note that it doesn't seem to be well grounded conceptually. It doesn't seem to look link in always the time to the conceptual framework of accounting. But despite all that, it's not just a platypus, it's a platypus wearing a snazzy hat because there is a lot of user demand for equity method of accounting, particularly by different types uh, of associates. And if we go on to the next slide, you'll see that that's not just our opinion, but there's been a lot of interest in this from standard setters as well recently. Um, the first one, we can see a direct quote from the European uh, group EFRAG talking about um, whether it's one line or measurement basis. The equity method is also a really pressing issue in some uh, economies we might not usually fo uh, focus or think about down here in New Zealand or Australia. Uh, so and it's a really pressing issue in Korea where they've got a different sort of common business structure. And so the Korean Accounting Standards Board has made uh, a lot of submissions on this and, and sort of criticized it around the guidance given in it for when it should apply. So it is a really um, important issue for a lot of different people for these things I've just talked about. Um, I would note that that, that that feedback reflects back to that feedback I was saying before, that some people have said we need to review the conceptual basis of equity accounting. So should we be doing it? And how should we be doing it? Some people criticize the scope of it by who should be doing it and when, and some people have been criticizing the requirements of it, so how should it be applied? Uh, and not only that, if we go on to another issue, uh, which is the next slide, that there's this recent exposure draft uh, for primary financial statements that came out uh, last year, and what that proposed is it said, not only should we think about associates, but there might really be two types of associates. There might be integral associates and non-integral associates. So integral associates are ones that are fundamental to the business. Maybe they share a brand or financing or something like that. And what they this, this uh, exposure draft said is that the share of profit from associates goes into the income statement, but the question is where should it go into the income statement? And this is a really important issue because where it goes to the income statement might affect some of your performance ratios like return on assets or your EBIT or EBITDA as was talked about so interestingly by our first speaker today, right? So what this exposure draft said is that the share of pros profit from uh, integral associates would go above EBIT and from non-integral it would go below EBIT. So this sort of raises another really hot uh, topic about uh, associates and equity accounting is that where should it go? Should it go above and into EBIT or below EBIT? And what do companies currently do before we make this change? Uh, so if I go on to the next slide about prior literature, um, I'm not gonna talk extensively about this, but there has been quite a bit of um, research on the equity method before. So the first tranche uh, I'll just describe as saying that companies think equity accounting is material in the effect it has on the financial statements. 
because there seems to be some clustering around whether companies try to choose to do it or not. The second cluster of research says that um, there's some mixed evidence in whether it's understood by analysts. So the way I reconcile that is that by saying that analysts don't seem to think equity method is any more complicated than alternative ways of accounting for investments in other companies, but all the accounting for investments in other companies is rather complicated. The third tranche, which we talk about, is that there's not much evidence on how companies actually do equity accounting, what they're disclosing about it, where they're putting the gains of values. So that's one of the real contributions of our papers, is providing some descriptive evidence about what companies are currently disclosing about it. And last, there is mixed evidence on whether equity accounting is useful. And the way the prior literature has typically done this is that they've tried to find associates for which there's the equity method, uh, the value of the associate calculated under the equity method, and then also calculated under an alternative method. Maybe they've also disclosed total assets so they can mimic proportion of consolidation. Maybe the company was a transition year where they had to disclose two different methods. Maybe the associate was listed and they could get the market value to proxy for the fair value. And then they compared which was more related to the parent share price. And this is really mixed. Sometimes the equity method is more value relevant, sometimes it's less. I, I tend to summarize this literature as saying that the equity method is better when it is more preferred by the user and they because they might have reasons for thinking it's more, uh, more useful to uh, for them. And so that's cases we might think about with career where the tribals and the intercompany structures are particularly complicated. So we go on just to summarize our, our research questions in the next slide. Um, so that's what we're looking at, the use and diversity of the equity method and whether it's useful. The way we do that um, is we, and by we, I mean uh, Laura, of course, uh, we got the annual reports for the two year two reports, and she hand collects a whole bunch of equity information from them. And we have 72 uh, associates uh, in 2015 and 80 in 2018. So I'll just pop on to the uh, sample statistics in the next slide. So out of those companies that have an associate, they typically have four associates. The mean investment in associate is 370 million, which is uh, of course about 5% of total assets. So they are pretty uh, material. Uh, it is a pretty material thing. Again, based on uh, what uh, uh, Martin was saying, material 5%, 8% maybe. So it is material, very material for profit. But we'll talk about this in the next slide. There's a large range. Uh, and there's our sample distribution by industry, uh, of course, pretty in indicative of the Australian uh, A6200. So we just pop on to the uh, next slide and I'll talk about the range. Um, <clears throat> so just some interesting things to note. First of all, the ownership level of associates, although the mean is right in that sweet spot I talked about, if we think about 20% being equity accounting and 50% being con uh, control or consolidation, the mean of 30% is right in that sweet spot. But you can see that companies' uh, investment ranges from 1% to 100% or uh, investments categorized as associates. And that's true, right? So we did double check those. We talked to procurers who confirmed that they have associates with a, that they have 100% investment in it. So this indicates that there's a lot of, um, that this isn't, as straightforward an issue as we may think when we just apply those rules of thumbs or those bright line, bright line thresholds. So there's a lot of um, complicated business structures going on here. Again, you can see a very large range in the investment in associates in terms of percentages and so on. Uh, and we've got some interesting information about the OCIs, which are uh, much smaller in size. So if I go on to the uh, uh, next slide, uh, and here we have a really interesting graph around the average ownership and associates. And you can see here that it pings up at 20% and again at 49%. So we sort of interpret this as companies where maybe there's some advantages, uh, view that there's some financial reporting advantages to, to structure it to go from 199 to 20% and be categorized uh, as an equity method of accounting. Okay, so our next slide, 
Now, this is one of our really interesting slides. So here what we have is the percentage of companies that disclosed this piece of information some here. So first of all, we can start off and we can see over 80% of companies have investment and associate on the face of the balance sheet. Now that's actually kind of interesting, right? Because again, our prize might be that everyone discloses it on the face rather than just on the notes. And if we can go down though, but a lot of those companies actually disclose it aggregated with joint ventures on the face. So they're just saying equity method or investments and associates on the face, and then the notes just aggregate that into whether it's associates or joint ventures, and then maybe sometimes into the value assigned to individual associates. Slightly less proportion uh, have share of profit. And again, we can see there's a smaller proportion of dividends. Um, and, but again, that might be because they don't actually have dividends from it. But we can see that half, about half the sample uh, are disclosing, 40% uh, are disclosing dividends. Now, uh, so if we go down to this purple group of disclosures, these are disclosures uh, which uh, are required under the accounting standards for material associates. So these are things like disclosing um, the revenue, revenue, assets and liabilities of an associate, uh, principal activity, country of incorporation, incorporation, reporting date. So these are things required only for material associates. So you can see that we see uh, the highest is 60% going down to only about 50% for these. So again, if you are really trying to back out um, the value of an associate, you can see it's not actually doable for most associates because it's not disclosed even in the notes. In terms of some of the other information that's really useful about associates, capital commitments, contingent liabilities, or an impairment, you can see that's fluctuating around that 20% mark, but again, we don't know what proportion have or don't have a capital commitment. Uh, overall, we would say that there's quite a lot of diversity in the disclosures. And furthermore, one of the interesting things we noted is that there's a lot of diversity in where it is in the notes, uh, excuse my terrible pun. Um, and what we mean by that is that some companies tend to put it in its own note, some companies might have sort of like a business combination note. Some like, times part of it could be in with a note to the income statement and some into a note with the balance sheet. So it is quite hard to uh, back out all this information looking through the notes, uh, unless you're quite experienced at it. So it would be quite hard for a lot of people. Uh, the next question we asked on the next slide was around where are companies putting that share of profit from associates in terms of its income statement location. Now remember that's really interesting because the ISB is proposing to split where it goes based on whether the associate is integral or a core part of the company's business. And what we find is that just over half the companies um, disclose it before EBIT, so I, it affects return on assets. About a third put it uh, uh, before profit, and then we have 10% that we can't figure it out for. And when we say we can't figure it out for, we mean we've gone back to the notes and tried to back it out. Of course, that's really hard to do if the number is zero or one or something. Now that's actually a little bit different than the ISB who found 72% located before operating income. One reason might be that we're using slightly different definitions of operating income uh, or EBIT. Uh, or it could be part of the reason could be that Australia has a bit more diversity in the type of companies that have associates. They might have more companies that have non-integral associates, uh, for example, in the mining sector. So they're more separable from the main business. So that's a very interesting uh, just piece of information considering that, uh, uh, that uh, recent um, exposure draft. Uh, so the next thing we did in the next slide is we looked at, uh, sorry, yeah. So what we did here is we did some uh, univariate tests and we did univariate tests on, um, we did univariate tests on some attributes of the associate and then attributes of the company investing in the associate. And then we first of all did whether it varied by disclosures. Now, the first thing to note is that it's very pleasing to see that there is greater disclosure for more important associates. And that's consistent with the accounting standard, which says they should be done for material associates. 
So you can see listed associates are more likely to disclose revenue assets liabilities, principal activity, country or incorporation, and reporting date. Uh, and the bigger the investment in associate is as a percentage, the more likely you are to disclose revenue and assets, principal activities, country or incorporation. And there's a little bit of evidence that some of these disclosures vary by the company's aspects, particularly by the leverage. So we've got size of the company, leverage, loss, and then some governance ones. Leverage is the only one that seems to consistently have better disclosures. The next thing we did is that, um, uh, the next thing we did is that we did uh, whether these attributes varied by reporting it before or after uh, EBIT. So the first thing we noted is that the associate, the more important the associate seemed to be more likely before EBIT, now that's probably consistent with being an integral core, but we also found that it varies by the company's attributes. So that's sort of uh, interesting because it really suggests that the, the something, saying it varies by that company's, say for example, governance attribute, isn't actually consistent with that proposed definition of integral that it should relate more to how, how embedded that associate is with the company. So that it suggests that developing that guidance will be difficult and imposing it. So that's our evidence on um, the use of equity accounting, the descriptive statistics around how it's disclosed and how it's done. So if we go to the next slide, uh, sorry, and two more, yeah, sorry. And, and here's how we tested whether we thought equity accounting was useful. What we did here, and uh, again, when I say we, I mean uh, Laura, of course, when she was hand collecting every company's, every associate, she made a note of whether the associate was listed and she checked the ones that weren't listed, whether or not they were listed. She then compiled this list of associates that were listed on either the ASX or another stock exchange like Jakarta or Malaysia or anywhere in the world. For those listed associates, she then backfilled between 2015 and 2018 so for all these listed associates, we had the, uh, the market value of them, the total assets from their own balance sheet, and we had what their investment in associate or the equity accounting value was. So we've got three values for these listed associates. Market value to proxy for fair value, total assets to proxy for proportionate consolidation, uh, and, and, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say total assets, I should say net total assets, right? Total assets minus total liabilities to proxy for proportionate consolidation and the equity method that they're reported under currently. We then took the company's share of each of these three different methods and we tested which one was more related to the parent company's uh, stock price. And that would be provide some indication which of the three possible accounting methods, remember, rough proxy for equity method, rough proxy for proportional correlation, and rough proxy for fair value is more useful. And that model is called the uh, Olson model. What we found is that the equity method was not value relevant in this small sample, but fair value or proportionate consolidation, uh, proportionate consolidation proxies were value relevant. So this suggests that investors find equity accounting less useful than either the higher up alternative or the lower up alternative. We also tried to do some tests whether this differed by some proxies for whether the associate would be considered integral based on same industry, size, uh, things like that. Uh, and we found no results for that. But I do note that we do have a very small sample size by limiting ourselves to listed associates to get that market value. That's uh, N60 for our sample. And it's also important noting that another limitation of the study is that we're conducting a horse race where we're sort of stacking it. Because as we all know, fair value is easy if the company is listed, because then there's this, uh, we're up a level one version of fair value where we've got that quoted active homogenous uh, share price to use the fair value. So we're using associates with a really strong fair value. We're not comparing equity method against perhaps level three versions of fair value, where it might be more harder to tease it out. That would be a really cool study to do, but unfortunately we don't have the data for it. Uh, okay, so uh, next to wrap up, we have our policy implications in the next slide. 
And this was really fun because we actually wrote our policy implications uh, at the start of October. And at the end of October, um, the IFRS, IFRS released uh, a staff uh, working paper on their proposed direction for the equity accounting uh, research project. So it was really interesting to compare what we recommend happens to what is actually gonna happen. So what we recommend happens is that the first thing we need to do is a conceptual basis review. The question is, should we do equity accounting to begin with, or should we use something else? Uh, and, and that's part of that is like, whether it's one line measurement, uh, one line consolidation, whether it is proportion consolidation or a measure basis. Should we use an alternative measurement basis overall? So that's the first question we think should be asked. The second question we think should be asked is who should do equity accounting? Should it be required for all associates or just associates with aren't an active fair value? Or should it be ones that are only integral or not integral? That's the second question we, we think should be asked. And that relates to a scope review that was pointed out by some people. The third and fourth things we, we think are really important to happen is how should it be done? So that's a requirement or an application review to try to standardize that diversity in the disclosure, the location of where it happens. We also note that some recent reporting practices around core and more reporting uh, and XBL would really highlight ways to uh, access that information by drilling down that information. We last of all conclude that that integral issue that I just talked about would be really complex. To loop it back to what IFRA suggested, they, their working paper only focuses on an application and it rules out a conceptual basis review uh, or a fundamental review as they term it. So they explicitly recommend against um, considering whether it's one line consolidation or measurement, they rule out, uh, they recommend against um, whether you should use other measurement basises, and they recommend against a scope review as well, whether it should still be applied on the basis significant. But we think answering those questions first are the way that you can figure out your applications. So it's really interesting uh, and timely issue it ended up being. It was a lot of fun to do this project. Um, and last, um, we're, we're popping over to the panel uh, next. But I promise you, uh, I will not duck your questions, so to speak. I'll get back to them uh, during the Q&A session. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks very much, Tom, for the presentation. And now we will just have the panel discussion session. So to mix the panel today, uh, we have Mr. Richard Fakery from Phoenix Portfolios. Richard is an equity analyst at Phoenix Portfolios a Melbourne-based boutique investment manager. Richard is a portfolio manager of the Cromwell Phoenix Opportunity Fund and a research analyst across the company's products. Richard is also a chartered uh, financial analyst. We also have Mr. David Gervin from the Washington Soul Pattison. Um, David joined Washington Soul Pattison as a chief financial officer in April 2018. David is a chartered accountant with over 20 years experience as an ASX listed CFO, operating in high growth or turnaround situations across industry as the diverse as e-commerce, financial services, and transport and logistics. David has also been a divisional chief executive leading a corporate trust business operating in Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. Last but not least, we have Mr. Paul Bronner from the PwC. Paul is a senior partner of PwC with 20 years experience as a partner, including five in the United States. Paul is, a, Paul is consulted widely by clients and within PwC on capital markets transactions, as well as WSB efforts, uh, US GAAP and SEC reporting. Paul is a designated global accounting consulting service partner responsible for interpretation of effort standard, sort leadership, and the PwC response to AISB exposure drafts. Paul is currently particularly focused on financial service clients and a large, uh, other large institutional clients seeking to issue bonds or equity on cross-border transactions. And to facilitate today's session, we have the WSB board member, Ms. Alison White, Alison is a leader of the National Accounting Technical Team in Deloitte's Assurance and Advisory Division. Alison has over 19 years experience 
uh, in audit and accounting adversary in Australia, Hong Kong, and South Africa, specializing in resolution of complex accounting issues. And following the panel discussion, we will have the Q&A session. So I will now hand over the mic to Alison. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Um, and, and thanks, Tom. I loved your passion for uh, the research that you've done. It's really good to see. And uh, I find your presentation very interesting. And thank you to Michael and Laura also for the, 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 the research that you've been conducting. Um, there's some very interesting things. And I think, um, Richard, maybe one of the things I might start with you is that from a user's perspective is uh, one of the findings that really, I guess, resonated for me was the fact that in, that um, the equity accounting might not be value relevant. And so I guess what I want to ask you is, do you as a user find the information produced by equity, equity accounting useful? Uh, perhaps as a general proposition, I would agree that for many companies, equity accounting provides less value relevant information than proportionate consolidation or, or fair value accounting. Um, as an example where proportionate consolidation may be more value relevant is real estate companies. They're often jointly or partially owned trusts that own real estate assets. And many investors look at the accounts on a proportionally consolidated basis anyway in those situations. Many of those um, entities present proportionally con consolidated information in, uh, in their presentations of company financial standard, um, company financial statements. For conglomerates or in, in investment houses such as salt patents and fair value accounting for listed JVs and associates is probably more value re relevant as a primary reporting method. Um, there's perhaps an argument that reporting could be improved by allowing the flexibility to, to account for into corporate investments with significant influence using different methods such as fair value or proportionate consolidation. Of course, there are material disadvantages in allowing flexibility as well. It, re it would reduce comparability. Um, entities would always choose the most favourable method of, of presentation. So it's, 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 not a, it's not an easy problem, of course. Um, one, one thing I, that Tom highlighted that I, uh, uh, I would say is frustrating is the, the discrepancy in the, in the format level and, and type of disclosure that we currently have among um, investments accounted for using the equity method is, is certainly an area that could be improved upon. Yeah. I might, I might come back to disclosure in a moment because I think there are a whole heap of interesting issues there. Maybe if I put you on the spot and asked a, a little bit more of a, a definitive question around if the standard setters were to remove equity accounting, would that be missed by you as a user? I, th I think it, well, I think it would depend what it was replaced with. I think equity accounted disclosures probably in some format are likely to still be required. So I think it's, it's easy in situations where um, the investment is in another listed entity where users can always go to the financial statements that that entity produces. But of course, not every entity is a reporting entity or maybe a limited reporting entity, in which case um, there needs to be some information provided. And if we were to move to fair value for everything, I, I probably would not be in favour of that um, personally, just due to the fact that you know, many, many investments do not have readily observable market values and that would introduce kind of additional kind of estimation and uncertainty into financial statements. So I think what I'm hearing you saying is you do view an investment which is slightly larger as being something different to just a, a passive 10% interest in, in an in entity. And so that additional information is valuable to, to, to you as the, as the user. That's right. I, th I think it, um, it's, it, it probably comes down to the materiality to the entity that you're, that you're looking at is, is probably the, the, the key to where you want additional inf information. 
Thanks, Richard. Um, David, you, you obviously bring a different perspective as a preparer of financial statements. Um, what are your thoughts on equity accounting and what are potentially some of the challenges you've experienced in implying it? Yeah, thanks, Alison. Well, look, um, I, I, you know, I think uh, Tom's presentation uh, was, was really good in terms of um, the, concept, the concept of, uh, you know, integral operations. I think equity accounting has a lot of value where, you know, there is comparability of businesses. And Richard said, you know, you're looking at a property trust. You know, if there's commonality across there, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, significant influence really um, doesn't allow for that at the moment. And that I find is a bit hard. Uh, other, other challenges for us are really um, significant influence doesn't mean you can do anything really. Uh, so for instance, if you've got uh, entities with different balance dates, um, you, you can't compel them to you know, uh, give you the information that it aligns to your own uh, balance date. So that's often a, a challenge. Uh, and I think uh, another thing that was highlighted in the, in the survey is, you know, some items relating to associates ended up getting salted away in different lines of the P&L. So, you know, if you've got to do a, a deferred tax uh, adjustment on your investment, you know, that'll go through your tax expense. If you've got an impairment, uh, it'll go through, you know, so it's, it's you yeah, know, for a non, uh, a user who's not familiar with how the, the standards work, um, it, 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 it is often quite difficult to uh, really get a, a fix on well, what is happening with the associates. Oh. Um, and, and, and finally, you've got nuances and tweaks of things like um, deemed disposals and bits and pieces like that, where we have a list of associates uh, our, our percentage ownership bounces up and down, even from things like um, uh, employee share plans in an investee, um, you know, might uh, trigger a, a deemed disposal. So we've got to sit down and fiddle through um, bits and pieces there. And, and David, from doing that, what do you consider as useful from the equity accounting for your own decision-making perspective? So when you're looking at your investees, yeah. Uh, well, to be frank, in terms of our investments um, and how we manage our business, and, and we're an investment house, so that, that's very different from uh, an integral uh, sort of conglomerate, which uh, uh, might have a completely different view. But for us, you know, we're like everyone else who has their own portfolio. Um, we, we focus on, you know, what the investments are worth. Uh, so often, because um, uh, many of our associates are listed, uh, you know, we do have level one information readily available um, for all of our others. And, and, and we have our own teams that, you know, spend a lot of time and we do have access to the data to, to really make sure we understand fair value uh, on, a, on a, you know, a cash flow basis is, is really important. So um, to run our business, you know, it's the value of the portfolio and the income we're getting from that, that portfolio, the two critical things. And for us, equity accounting, we don't, you know, we have to do it because the standard says so. Um, but we don't use it as a, as a guide to make our investment decisions. So I think in many ways, it then becomes a challenge for uh, investors in our business uh, to use it. So we, we then provide alternative measures, which uh, we hope that uh, our invest, our, the investors in our business will find more useful. So we honour it in the breach. Yeah, it's always interesting when you feel the need to supplement the accounting standard requirements with other disclosures, it, it sort of draws into question, is, that, is there a specific reason for that? Or is it actually because potentially there's something in the standards that need to, needs to be thought about or provide allowance for? So. Yeah, and, and, and the challenge, I think, is that, you know, in the, in the valuation hierarchy, um, you know, uh, you've got something that most people would prefer to use. If, if you have a listed associate, um, and you've got observable market transactions in a, in a solid market, well, it's very hard to argue you shouldn't use that to, to value. Um, but of course, uh, the way uh, the standard works, you know, we can't do that. So, um, so the only way around that then is to give people that extra information to allow them to work it out for themselves or, or actually give it to them. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there, there, is, uh, there is some tension around... Um, uh, and, and obviously, if you went back 25 years ago, that's, you know, probably was less of an issue because people weren't, you know, the concept of fair value was, uh, you know, wasn't as well developed then. 
Mm, and I think that's interesting because from my perspective, that's why now is actually a really good time to rethink this basis because the world's moved on. And I think people are far more comfortable with the estimation uncertainty that exists with fair values, even in the unlisted space. So uh, interesting. Yeah, and and I, I, I understand um, uh, Richard's point about, uh, you know, as an analyst trying to dig in and, and, and work out. Uh, and then I think then it's really incumbent on uh, people like ourselves. If you do have, you know, material unlisted associates, um, you know, you, you disclose as you would for, um, you know, uh, carrying value impairment testing of non-current assets, you know, discount rates and growth rates and, and bits and pieces. So you at least get people uh, the threats to, to allow them to form their own view on value. Mm. Paul, oh, don't want to leave you out there, sorry. <laughs> maybe moving on to, to disclosures. Uh, well, maybe, maybe Alison, if I could jump in on a couple of points there, though. I mean, where we do have, um, you know, clients with um, listed equity investments, it's quite interesting when it comes to impairment testing. Um, they don't necessarily want to just simply go to using the, um, the listed price as the basis for an an impairment test, which is usually, you know, higher of recoverable amounts, higher of um, fair value, less cost to sell or, or um, your value and use, right? So you, you do get into, you do, you do get into an interesting dynamic um, there. Um, but I just wonder, it's also possibly worthwhile going back a step and just saying, can we all agree that the equity method is better than the cost method? Because Obviously, I don't think there's any particular mystery. Tom presents the equity method like it's some sort of um, mystery um, journey or something as to what it's going to generate. But, um, you know, given we've got a whole lot of standards that say a particular entity should derive their net income in a particular way, they come up with their net income, you own 20% of it, so you pick up 20% as your, your earnings number, basically, is the concept. Um, I don't know that that's particularly challenging as a as a concept or anything. I, I, don't, I don't know why there's so much skepticism with that. And, um, and so I just wonder, I mean, I presume no one's advocating the cost method. Um, uh, look, I, Tom, I, of I, yeah, my, my, my view on that, you know, uh, I, I'd move more to a sort of a fair value uh, method. Um, uh, and, and in terms of, you know, look, for me, I've sort of, got our audit committee to a journey that, uh, you know, market price is market price. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if, there's, uh, if it's below um, the equity carrying value, well, you write it down. So, um, you know, that, that's just the way things, I understand there's often pressures the other way, but um, uh, it seems to me that you can't sort of believe in the market in one hand and then say, oh, actually it doesn't work in the other. You know, I know there's times where it's uh, not always the case, but, um, yeah. So. Uh, no, I, I agree. I think I think it's just a question. Of, a, a lot more thought needs to go in, though, in terms of, in terms of actually making sure that if we, you know, extend, I guess, the application of the fair value methods, that people are quite clear, I guess, in terms of how 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 that's going to um, improve things, and 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 it clearly can improve if, if if you've just simply got a series of equity investments that are actually listed and they have a price, and your only involvement is via that investment. But we also have a lot of um, equity method investments where there, you know, there's there's quite a lot of tie-ins, you know, whether it's distribution agreements or um, sh um, management. IP sharing or very various various uh, reasons why those sort of strategic investments have been made and 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 to the extent they might be viewed as at off market prices the equity method investment could either either look incredibly valuable or incredibly um, not valuable but unless you're actually um, reporting the entity's entire value and showing how much value you think is coming out of the equity investment versus the other contracts and relationships you've got, you may only be showing one piece of the puzzle, you know, so um, I'm kind of curious as to how, how it would actually come together. Um, we still only have, you know, sort of fair value disclosures by exception and impairment testing and so on um, for most, you know, for, for most uh, segments or most business activity, I guess. So, um, 
um, you know, exactly what the intention would be with with um, picking up equity investments and going to fair value. You'd have to question why 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 it wouldn't apply uh, in other cases. And so, Paul, I guess looking at the disclosures, what is your experience around disclosures um, as to what you think one is critical disclosure from your perspective as the auditor? And I guess what's your insight around why different clients would do different things given the diversity of the research? Well, I, th I think... Um... I think the, the disclosure requirements aren't too too bad as a list of requirements. So it, it sort of seems to be the application. I mean, generally speaking, you do want to be able to see, particularly equity method investments that you have involvement with or related party transactions with. You, you do kind of want to see what the underlying uh, revenues and um, cost structure of the equity method investment is and how leveraged it actually is and you know what commitments you do have to support that. You know, some of the pressure on the equity method investments has been a little bit taken away by the consolidation standard, expanding the definition of control over time to pick up a lot more of those in substance consolidated um, um, associates that we used to previously have have as sort of an off balance sheet structure. So, um, you know, may, maybe improvements to those standards have alleviated the pressures a bit, but the basic stand requirements are there. The inconsistency though, um, you know, the presentation standard uh, 101, I mean, it actually has a black letter requirement for investments in equity method investments. Equity method investments in that line can mean joint venture equity method plus associate uh, joint ventures. So, and then the standard itself says you can do, use different captions and change the names if it's appropriate. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me if, uh, that there's sort of, um, um, a lack of conformity or, you know, or standardization. Um, but if a company wants to do it well, they can certainly do it well. And I think the standards provide a framework. The only thing that seems to be clearly missing is, um, is a requirement to do fair value disclosure, like we do for other financial instruments, for example, that are carried, carried uh, at amortized costs. We, we don't have a requirement to actually disclose the fair values of equity method investment. So that could be a useful addition based on what Richard and David and the Tom's research shows. Mm. Um, if that was done well, and I've got to say a lot of clients resist putting in even the sensitivity disclosure on, um, you know, goodwill and intangibles and other things at the moment. And um, yeah, so, uh, you know, there'd be challenges where clients have, have unlisted investments trying to get the right disclosure there. But if, if that's really value relevant, then maybe it, you know, it should be addressed. And, you know, that would be a good stepping stone, I would suggest. Um, well, that, that's a potential disclosure stepping stone. I think the fundamental question, and maybe be interested in views of each of the panel members here, from a standing standard setting perspective, you know, do do we see that there is a case for change? And for for you as a user or a preparer or an auditor, do you want to see the case for change? Um, I think Tom mentioned the paper that was discussed at the October ISB meeting, which is very much proposing identifying the problems, and they've identified a list of the problems, and then they'll try and address them by identifying what the principles are. Is, is that enough, or do we actually think? While the model is simple and can be understood, Paul, I think, do we actually believe that is the right model and they actually need to do a fundamental review because that standard's been around a pretty long time? Um, do we think they need a fundamental review? So who would like to go first? <laughs> Richard? Uh, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer to some of this stuff. You know, it's... Um, it's um, obviously challenging. I, I would be in favour of a fundamental review. I, th I think there are, um, we, I think we could certainly standardise um, uh, some of the disclosures. Um, and, you know, I would be in favour of kind of mandating some additional disclosures. In particular, I would like EBIT to be required to be um, disclosed for 
um, equity method investments. You know, pro analysts are you know, commonly trying to assess or you know, reconcile to an EBIT number. And you know, obviously, um, more often than not, you, you don't get that information um, with um, the equity method disclosures at the moment. So I think that would be a kind of an easy change that would certainly benefit um, analysts. Um, look, I, I think there's, there is perhaps an argument for, for allowing um, some flexibility um, with um, choosing different methods of accounting, but there are um, obviously disadvantages with that. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best person to make a judgment of, of whether um, the disadvantages um, would outweigh the benefits of increasing um, flexibility. It's certainly a, a very complicated and difficult area. Yep. And been around a long time. That's <laughs> <laughs> solved today. Paul, David, do you have any views around the case for standard setting or the one thing that you would like to see, I guess, revisited? Well, I, think, I think from my perspective, Alison, the, um, there have been a, lot, a number of long-standing questions in terms of how you apply the method. Um, I, in a lot of these areas, um, I would prefer it at times if, if the ISB just weighed in and picked a method so that people were doing those particular sort of more difficult application areas consistently. Um, they seem to always sort of delve into it and then they sort of retreat and, and then they delve into it and then they retreat and, and the result is that practice goes on. But on the other hand, um, you know, absent them fixing the standards, life goes on and we seem to manage to report every year. So um, I don't know. I, I, just, I just think that um, if, if, if they do want to do a wholesale review, um, you know, I don't see any harm in, in harm in it. It's just that there's been a number, you know, a number of those sort of efforts. Um, and um, so I guess I would, uh, I, I'd rather see them really focusing on, on shorter term things that could actually improve disclosure rather than going through some effort and then producing nothing, you know, I suppose is sort of one of my concerns. So. <laughs> It's interesting because I think for me, the fundamental thing is that because there are so many application questions and they never quite get resolved, it, to me, it feels like there's something um, wrong with the conceptual basis. Um, so. Yeah, I don't think it's that hard myself. I, 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 th I think we, and that's why we end up working out a solution and, and as long as people can see what's happening, they can, they can work it out. But I mean, look, I, I've no doubt it could be improved they just seem to duck and dive away from actually making those sort of improvements. I don't think jumping to some restated formulation of the standard without a commitment to also tackling those sort of issues is going to necessarily lead to any okay. utopian outcome. <laughs> so. Thanks, Paul. David? Oh, look, I think, you know, just to pick up on the points of the different panelists. So, you know, I, I'd say that there's, you know, in the near term, there's some practical things that can be done very quickly that would make sense. And, and I think Paul and Richard have touched on those. You know, if you've got, um, if you have uh, better valuation data, um, you should disclose it. Um, if uh, if uh, you, you need to give further detail on material associates on their operating performance and allow users then to make a judgment uh, to uh, assess value. So I, I think the enhancements to disclosures could be made quite quickly under the existing standards, but then there needs to be a commitment to look at it in a more conceptual holistic view, where I think, um, you know, the research bears this out where you've got a, an integral uh, sort of situation, it makes a lot of sense to do some form of equity accounting or even think about proportional consolidation. Um, but but, you know, for outside of that, then I think um, maybe um, you narrow down the use of equity accounting. And if it's just, uh, you know, you're doing it more as a portfolio basis, uh, you'd move to using some of the well-worn path of ASB 9 and, and actually just simplify uh, the choice for people. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're sort of spot on time. So I might, um, thank you very much for your insights. I think I've, we've got a number of questions, I think, popping up on the Q&As. I might hand over to uh, Mark to work through the questions, if you're there, Mark.
Yep. Thanks, Alison. Uh, yes, as you said, there's a number of questions and they'll keep on rolling in. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm seeing some questions. I think this first one came in early, so I'll direct it to Tom. Uh, the question there was uh, drawing a contrast between uh, the equity concept of equity accounting in the US, where uh, it was stated that uh, the concept of equity accounting in the US consists of principles such as voting interests and is there, thereby fundamentally catered towards a power of control in an organisation. Whereas in Australia with IFRS, uh, cost-based equity accounting is the only lawful method available. Interest-based like the US is mainly for markets that are financially oriented however, would have a higher risk of failures and lower confidence in reported profits that are based on such interest-based methods. What are your thoughts on the comparison as described there? Um, yeah, well, I, I think just in relation to that and another question is that it is quite important to think about what is the basis of application for the equity method. And that's really one of the important things to figure out before you can think about what are the disclosures you want for the equity method. So um, conveniently, we don't have to do this piece of research because there's a really great piece of research by a University of Technology Sydney team who presented at another forum like this last year, uh, Martin Bujar, Nelson Ma, uh, Anna Bedford. And what they looked at is the change under IFRS in the threshold for applying consolidation, moving away from a strict definition, like I think he's implying under, they're implying under uh, US GAAP, to the current one, which is more principle-based. And they found a significant increase in the number of uh, 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 investments being con consolidated. So I, I think it's just a really good takeaway that uh, principles do seem to increase the number of uh, uh, companies being consolidated. And it is really important we think about what we're trying to do with equity accounting before we can figure out who should apply and under what basis they should apply. Yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, Mark, just... Yeah, Mark, just to jump in there um, with my US gap uh, hat on. Um, the, actually, the US, um, obviously, the US have a, have a fairly aligned standard on co consolidation with IFRS. Um, and, and in addition, the equity method standard in the US is actually also based on significant influence and is also, you know, actually very similar to the ISB standard. So, I, I to be honest, I didn't quite get where the standard where, where that comment was coming from because um it, it, you know the equity method is defined in us gaps actually very similar to is 28 well thanks there paul and i and i suppose there the 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 author of that question was looking to see um get some feedback on their um dichotomy if you like that they were putting and uh certainly you provided um a useful insight on that uh Got a question here uh, that was asking about uh, and was putting the point that accounting practices and disclosures seem to be fairly random. Um, just sorry, sorry. Uh, and this likely reflects on the result. Is this a consequence of deficiencies in the standard, limitations in meaningful disclosures, or compliance? And I think perhaps I heard um, that. Alison might have had a view on this and also that uh, Paul might have had a view, but perhaps if I could ask Alison um, to respond to that question. Sure. Um, I mean, it's an interesting one. I think from my perspective, there are some clear requirements around what is required to be disclosed under the accounting standards. And I think quite often materiality comes into, it, into play as to where it sits or whether it's aggregated or disaggregated. I think the comment that I would make where I do see, uh, I, I think the thing that's missing is the disclosures in the notes, which gives that more granular detail around the these associates performance and their balance sheet as well. So if you, if you think equity accounting is the right way to go, I think more granular disclosure around, as Richard said, EBIT, EBIT or EBITDA, and then understanding the debt that sits in the underlying associate, associate, because we often see associates used, um, or the debt sitting in the associate level rather than the consolidated level. And I think the level of gearing and leverage is really important for, for um, users on the market to actually understand. So you might not have a highly leveraged um, company at the investor level, but if it's highly leveraged at the investee level, I think that's important information. Thanks, Alison. Um, Paul, do you, do you have a comment?
comment there? Uh, not, not really. I mean, I, I, I agree. I kind of agree. There are black letter requirements in terms of the disclosures. So, um, without really knowing the specifics, I've, I mean, you know, I, I just sort of would revert back to all the different sets of financials that I look at with these sort of disclosures. And, you know, I think companies, you know, make every effort to do what they're required to. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just not quite sure why, you know, aside from materiality. And I think, you know, there was a comment earlier on materiality and I do, you know, I do tend to agree with that. Um, um, you know, possibly there's uh, some of these disclosures which may be omitted on the basis of, of the definition of materiality are actually material to someone that is actually trying to, you know, make some adjustments in terms of how they value a company with equity method investments. So they actually need all of the information to make sure they've actually got, you know, got, uh, um, to have tackled the problem properly notwithstanding that a, a, um, a company on its own might look at the disclosure and say it's not that material to our financial statements. So I don't know. Uh, and Mark, if I could just jump in just as a practical thing, um, you know, in our case, you know, we, we have a number of associates, some of them are, are quite uh, are material to our business. So uh, I understand the need to put the extra data in. Um, what, what tends to happen though is you're aggregating numbers and you come up with a, a, a really a blamange of stuff that really doesn't mean anything. And what is more relevant is the ability to go back to the individual investee. And fortunately, each of them are listed. So you can get, you know, all the information you need in their published data. So there, there's a piece, you know, you end up putting stuff in there, which complies with the standard, you have to do that. But it's as for anyone who's trying to analyze, it's just a complete waste of time so uh, uh, and of course you can't cross-reference into other things um, so uh, that, that's just a, an interesting dilemma that you can sort of practically face when you're preparing financial reports. Thank, thanks Dave. Uh, so a, a further question here is uh, does equity accounting reflect the true legal position of the investment and if it, it does not seem to be allowed in equity accounting Shouldn't this be disclosed as part of the standard, not blithely ignored as the standard seems to encourage? Surely for the user, they should have been clearly told what is hidden. So perhaps I could ask, uh, put that question to uh, Richard in the first instance. Uh, any thoughts on that, Richard? Well, I, I, I guess if, if, um, if, if percentage interests are clearly disclosed, then I, I, th I think the, the kind of the legal position should be obvious. Like, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if the question is, is kind of around kind of the, the level of control and that you're incorporating a, um, um, a result from um, an investment that you, you only have significant influence over and not control. I'm, I'm not 100% I'm not sure of the... Um, of the um, of the thrust of the question, but I would say that when assuming that um, and it's not always very clear, but assuming that um, the percentage ownership interests in the underlying investments are clearly disclosed, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it can be that um, two entities have very similar sounding names, and you have a whole bunch of percentages in trying to work out well what is actually the entity that is. Um, um, that is the material entity that I'm looking at for this individual company. But I, I, I think assuming someone's familiar with that um, uh, and, you know, the critical um, uh, accounting policies would often um, you know, kind, of, kind of make reference to, um, uh, to, um, to the, um, uh, the equity method of accounting. So, you know, that's another kind of disclosure that's in financial statements that should be clear for users. Okay. Thank, thanks, Richard. And I, I think there that, uh, as you've identified, the interaction between significant in influence and uh, control and, uh, and therefore, and, and or not having significant, significant influence, therefore those different outcomes that can um, lead. And I suppose that for some, they would argue that, a stark percentage terms would actually be perhaps a better outcome, or at least in, in terms of in terms of at least uh, what this question was put. Um, 
anybody else ha have a view on that um, that they'd like to share? Anybody? Any? Uh, any well, I think Mark, just the you know, well, I, I think um, just the intent of the question, you know, um, percentage shareholding is one thing. Uh, but, you know, clearly, if you're trying to make a, a, an assessment of the overall uh, financial health of the, the, the combined entity, um, you know, often equity accounting uh, and getting underneath, as Alison said, often, you know, people can salt away debt into, into capital structures, understanding, you know, the linkages and across defaults and, and, and things like that, that there, there tend to be things that are, um, you know, uh, buried away in note disclosures, which, uh, uh, you know, I would have thought analysts and, and, and people like that do want to get good visibility on because, you know, if, if something unforeseen happens, they can quickly assess, you know, what, what might be the knock-on implications for that. So, um, you know, percentage ownership, significant influence is one thing. I think it's uh, then being able to dig in underneath and understand is there any sort of other invisible threads that binds the entities together that are that are critical for you know anyone doing a, a comprehensive uh, analysis. Thanks, David. In the in the end, um, echoing what David's saying, the um, if you've got a complex uh, uh, capital structure in the equity method investment, um, you know, with potential voting rights and convertible instruments and op warrants and options and so on. You know, to be honest, it's going to be complicated whether you're in the equity method or the fair value method because, you know, if you try to, you know, present the fair, fair value information, you you know, you've also got to work out, you know, some of the fair values of some of those other instruments as well, which might be fairly straightforward if it's if it's level one and uh, listed, but if it's unlisted, you know, it becomes sort of a mark to model exercise. And, um, you know, I'm sure someone could, you know, if we do all of that, someone, someone, someone will do some research in a few years' time. Probably Tom will probably still be doing the same research, um, and um, and they'll work out that there's an inconsistency in the amount of disclosure made in relation to potential voting rights and other instruments because it's hard to actually provide all the disclosure. US companies tend to do it quite well, but it actually runs for pages, so you really have to know what you're reading in order to really use the information. Um, but it's also something that's a challenge in the equity method. You know, what percentage of the re result do I have if I've got, you know, 20% of the ordinary shares, but I've also got an interest in some sort of convertible instrument. So, um, um, and those are the sort of areas which the um, ISB or, and others have been slow to issue extra guidance on just to help ensure it's consistently done. Thank you. Uh, if, so, so I'll just agree with Paul that, that uh, there's a really great comment from Kevin saying that nothing has changed since 1973. I, I, and, you know, I think, I think there's an equity accounting research project every 50 years, which is uh, a really great value for young researchers to invest in, I think. Um, but but I, I just wanted to get to something that sort of came up that was really interesting. Because when we talk about associates, Sometimes we use language like how the ISB tries to describe integral. We say things like common financing, common brand, um, almost the idea that you can't sell it, can't be separated. And, and th these are all the ideas that come out in integral. So it's really interesting to me that when we talk about associates, we almost ourselves try to say maybe they should be accounted for differently uh, based on the type of associate they are. And so that really gets back to why, and, and I, I sort of sound like I'm beating a drum here, a fundamental review is so important because you could really, I'm very convincible that you could say there's a subgroup of associates, the ones that are, have a shared brand, source from one, for, uh, get their funds from the same pot, um, integrated supply chains, only do business with the parent, that, that for them, fair value makes no sense. I think you could say that. But you could also easily say that this other group of associates that have nothing to do with the parent, but just have that legal 25% investment, um, should not, that something like being fair value would be much more appropriate. Um, I, I, I think is what it gets back to for me. But it is interesting to me that we use that language uh, like the standard does. So, mm -hmm. I'll see you in 50 years, Paul, for the uh, next uh, one, right? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, and I might just pick up on Kevin's Kevin's point because I feel quite passionately about that one too. I think uh, if you're going to look at this, let's do it properly and get it right and think about all the issues that need to be thought about. Yes, it might take a long time. It 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 uh, think about it can only be better than leasing, and yet it uh, might even be quicker than leasing. If we think about that. <laughs> But, that, but that's why we that's why events like this are so important uh, just to uh, plug the ASB is that hopefully this has provided uh, research and uh, user user and prepare perspectives to allow the ASB to go to the ISB and say hey actually uh, we should do a fundamental review uh, at some point we shouldn't just you know uh, uh, you know paint the outside of the house maybe we need to make sure that the roof is correct as well uh, Tom, just um, picking up on what you, you know, that discussion there and uh, your paper looked at associates and uh, didn't consider joint ventures. Um, I don't know what the, what the um, literature uh, says on joint ventures, if anything, but um, any, any insights on that in terms of equity accounting with joint ventures? Yeah, it's a great question. So the, the literature is pretty well over the place in what they're actually comparing. Uh, associates with joint ventures, uh, jointly controlled entities, uh, excluded subsidiaries, because equity accounting has had such a fascinating history into whom it's applied for. So there's some really great um, research. Probably the most compelling one, um, just, just to speak the name, uh, was Richardson et al. And what they did is they used a setting where in Canada, at a point in time, uh, jointly controlled entities had a choice between equity accounting or proportionate consolidation. And what their really interesting finding was, is that basically, if you could choose, you'd probably choose the one that was most useful for you. So companies that had previously accounted for their jointly controlled entity using equity method and then were forced to move to proportionate consolidation, The ones that are chosen at the hobby brought. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so I think the method uh, message is that these the story still applies to joint ventures or jointly controlled entities, but there are these subgroups for whom it is more or less useful. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Maybe Tom. I could, if I could jump in with a question myself, Mark. Um, at the moment, we have sort of fair value through profit and loss, for example, if, if you're, uh, um, um, you know, have a trading, an equity trading business or something, you, you, you know, the uh, changes in value of those equity securities would all go through profit and loss. Um, but we also have a fair value through OCI with no recycling model. So that kind of implies that if I sell those investments, um, it's not part of my operating performance because I kind of bury them in equity. Um, and my profit and loss for those um, so-called strategic investments um, just becomes whatever dividend I get, uh, effectively a cost method for income statement purposes uh, with the fair value changes going through equity. So again, when um, Richard posed the question earlier, um, when you, when Alison asked what, you know, what would be preferred? Uh, he, he was cautious around, well, what will it be? <laughs> so <laughs> at the moment, would we really want to go through, you know, to shift all associates um, onto fair value through OCI with no recycling and just have a dividend return going through income? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've got a real question as to how that could be more valuable than the equity method myself, but um, I don't know what others think. Oh, Paul, I'll give you an answer from uh, from our perspective and, and, and really having it as an investment entity in a portfolio. Um, look, at the end of the day, you know, um, long as the portfolio is stated fairly, um, uh, we get a big tick from, you know, fair value through OCI whether you know the fact that we uh, there's a capital gain or loss embedded in all of that doesn't really uh, worry us too much, um, and you know we have a covenant with our shareholders to uh, continually keep increasing their dividends. So uh, in our case, um, and that's why not always apply for you know businesses in different stage of a life cycle or completely different uh, structure. Um, you know, just recording dividend income is uh, and cash is 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 absolutely fine, uh, so long as we can then you know pass that on in ever increasing dividend to our shareholders. So, for us, um, 
you know, uh, we had a recent situation this year where we de-equity de accounted a, a previous associate and moved it onto that basis. Uh, and, you know, everyone was very comfortable that that's a meaningful way to go forward. I think in practice, investors are kind of aggregating all the fair value adjustments, whether it be through OCI or, or through the P&L. Now, obviously, it kind of, it distorts headline metrics enormously. And, um, you know, one must be very careful at looking at kind of, um, you know, kind of one line kind of numbers, um, you know, which kind of might be frustrating for kind of less sophisticated users who, who quite reasonably just want a uh, comparable impact number, which they can, uh, they can assess. Um, but I, I think from an analyst point of view, I, I think all of, all of those um, changes are getting aggregated um, and analysed kind of separately, regardless of whether it's through the PNL or, or um, OCI. Hmm. Uh, there's a question here, if we were to start from a blank sheet of paper for those um, investments, non-controlling investments for 20 to 50% investments, would we come up with equity accounting? Um, and no, the answer is no, we would not. I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question and the answer is no, we would not. I think clearly the answer is no. That's a categoric uh, so no. You asked it, but, but great question and the answer is no. Any others? Any, oh, we, any others? Well, we, we did have a blank sheet of paper in 1973 and we came up with that. <laughs> was only negative 13 at the time, Paul, so I wasn't able to provide feedback on that one. I, I missed my opportunity. We are probably using a typewriter at that time. Hmm. I think I'd agree with Tom. I think the answer would be no, we wouldn't come up with it again. But it, but it does beg the question for these associates where there are these ties or links, what is the right accounting? I think, I think that's the one that would need to be thought through further. Yeah. I think I'd echo Tom's comments as well, that uh, we, we probably would choose a, a different method, although, um, you know, I, th I think a lot of caution needs to be used when changing methods. You know, I, I, I think uh, AASB 16 has taught everyone that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, now, I'm just scrolling up here to look at these uh, questions. Uh, Sorry. Uh, okay, this question here, I'll just see if I can. Um, in a situation where an associate is part of a portfolio, is it evident that the IS28 doesn't allow to disclose economic substance that the entity is purported to disclose? Perhaps in such a situation, the standard should be flexible to account for it under IFRS 9. And this might have been referring to uh, Dave, David, to your, um, to your comment earlier in terms of a flexibility to account for this under IFRS 9. Could, could you perhaps just speak to that again, please? Um, yeah, look, I, I, I suppose my point was, um, you know, if we make a new investment uh, and it may be, um, you know, if it's into a, a, another listed vehicle uh, and uh, there's a, a case for significant influence, um, then, then I think the, you know, obviously you've got to go through the, the rules and that pushes you down the path of equity accounting. Um, but we would then tend to supplement that with uh, information that allows people to assess, you know, what, what the fair value is. Um, where though uh, it's uh, maybe, you know, an investment in a different stage of life cycle. So it might be a private business um, where we're patient providers of capital. Uh, we don't actually get involved with the, day-to-day -day running of the business. Uh, that's really, we partner with a management team to do that. Um, that that's where it sort of gets a bit tricky because, um, uh, you know, fair value is really going to be a sort of a level three uh, exercise. Uh, and obviously people will have different views ar around all of that. Um, but you, you sort of go down the, the, the path of equity accounting. So, um, you, you know, it's, yeah, I, I think you can only sort of cure that by, by you know, further disclosure and, and if it's material and a lot of these things aren't initially, um, you know, giving people the key 
the key uh, indicators that you've used to come up with fair value and allow people to form their own view. Thanks, David. Uh, okay, I've got a, a question here that actually is relating to auditors and uh, how much influence, don't know if that's significant influence or not, but how much influence should the ISB have in educating auditors? The, the comment that's made here is that too often auditors in my 30 year experience practice form over substance in conflict with ASB 101. So frustrating. So uh, any, any, any response um, to, that, to that particular observation? Perhaps I should ask Alison. <laughs> Um, interesting one. I mean, I, I might dis um, respectfully disagree potentially with that as a view. I think we're pretty good from an accounting standard perspective in looking at, at substance. I think one of, the, one of the questions that I always look at, not specifically to equity accounting, when I'm assessing the accounting treatment of issues is what are the cash flows? What's, what, what's happening? What are the legal rights and obligations with that? What's the reason behind why the company is doing the transaction? All of those things talk to substance. Um, so, um, I, 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 maybe we don't always get it right and maybe there are some instances where there are more legal requirements. I think if I look at the share based payment standard, that might be a more legally based one. But um, for me, most, most commonly, I like to think that we do think about the, the substance over form. I think it's very, very important. Thank you. Uh, and, and just as a, you know, uh, as someone who's dealt with auditors over a long period of time, yeah, it's not been my experience. That, um, uh, and you know, it's often the, it's often the culture of the organisation you work for <laughs> that might dictate, you know, the outcome you get with the with the auditors. But you know, for us, very practical. Um, you, you, you know, there's always going to be the nuances with the standard, uh, and and of, often outcomes in IFRS are probably sometimes counterintuitive. But then that just forces you to further and deepen the conversation and, and really then go back and test that substance over form and, and, and be, uh, be more thoughtful about the outcome. And, you know, um, the auditors that I've come across in my career, yeah, I, I, I can't, I, I struggle to find one who was very formulaic um, and deterministic. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and, you know, not being, and then that's not being passive or, um, not wanting to just acquiesce to what management wants. It's always uh, very much uh, a, a forthright, uh, you know, conversation of professionals. Thanks, David. But on a similar topic, Alison, I'd be interested in how auditors get feedback from users of financial statements, you know, like, like shareholders. Obviously, there's, because there's obviously confidentiality issues and, Investors can, you know, ask a question at the annual general meeting, but rarely do. How how does that interaction kind of work in practice for for things like in, ensuring kind of um, uh, substance over form? It is a very very good question because um, I personally and and. Uh, often say when people are consulting me, what will users find interesting? What what what, what will the investors of this company say? Um, and uh, I think sometimes we know the answers, sometimes we don't know the answers. Um, as you say, it's, there's, n uh, you know, there's not a, there isn't direct involvement. It's formally, the questions are formally submitted through the, a the AGM process. We do speak to investor relations and to management to say, what questions are you regularly asked? Um, but it's, uh, it probably is one step removed, I would say, in that, um, in that sort of, I guess, the chain. I don't know, Paul, if you've got a different view on or different insight. Uh, I, th I mean, I think over time we've tried all sorts of different things in terms of, you know, um, having financial reporting update conferences that in include the user or analyst community. We've, um, over time, as, as the standard setting process has become more formalised and elaborate, um, you know, they've established consultative groups with you know, the user community such that it now has quite a strong voice. But a lot of those are things that auditors are, and, and that we're supportive of trying to get that voice at, at the table. Um, and then when we've gone through significant change, like uh, this year with COVID-19 and COVID-19 disclosures and 
um, ECLs for banks and things like that. We've had, you know, discussions with regulators um, like ASIC and APRO, but we've also had discussions with, um, you know, various communities uh, of interest that have been, you know, particularly, for example, some of the bank analysts um, were keen to get briefings uh, along the way to understand how people were thinking about it. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of, you know, relatively open uh, uh, dialogue uh, there, but um, um, yeah, whether whether it's uh, enough, I'm not sure. But there's, you know, we're always looking for more, I guess, and and there's a lot of opportunities for, you know, different groups to, you know, to provide feedback on accounting treatments and so on. So. I think it's done more in the industry forum type bodies rather than specific client, obviously because of confidentiality and. Okay. Then. I second that, Richard. Sorry, I second that. We would always welcome the the feedback um, and uh, and understanding of those issues that occur to you. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Thanks very much, Alison. And we're actually at the end of our session, and so I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Tom for his uh, excellent presentation. And it obviously did raise a, n a number of our uh, questions, as can be seen through the. Uh, question and answer process to Alison um, for her facilitation uh, of the panel and also um, stepping in to answer some questions and uh, share her views. And then um, to Richard, David and Paul for uh, participating in the panel session and also uh, taking on questions and uh, providing um, their uh, insights to those uh, questions. So thank you, thank you very much. I won't okay, forget so Perry, the sna with the sna Perry the platypus for, with the snazzy hat. <laughs> <laughs> that can be also a new conceptual model for, uh, I expect to see that in the academic literature at some point in time. Uh, in the accounting academic literature, not, not in the zoology uh, uh, literature. Okay, I'll pass over then to my colleague Al and uh, thank you. Thanks everyone, that's an excellent session. Um, so a great start to the day so far. We will now take another short 15 minutes break and return back at 11.45 to proceed with the research team to uh, research project. So WSB 16 has been picked up a few times. So make sure you come back for the second session, implementing WSB 16 leases, the investor and the preparer's perspective. See you all later, thank you. <laughs>